In 1985, belated history was made when a Tony Award was finally given to a woman set designer. Eighteen years later, you can still count the number of American women set designers with Tony Awards on one finger of one hand. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday, and our guest today is Heidi Ettinger, who won her Tony for Big River in 1985 and another in 1991 for The Secret Garden. Is this even worth talking about, this women thing? It's bizarre. You, it sort of is worth talking about. Okay, good. Because I, I found it, I find it mysterious. I've, I've never understood it. I keep looking uh, over one's shoulders, waiting for the hordes of women to be yes. following this me. This is how I feel about women critics. It's, you know? it's okay, really where weird. You? Where are yes. you? Where yes. are you? Yes. We're waiting for you to show up, uh -huh. and somehow they don't. And I, I, I find it really baffling after all these years. Now, when you were at Yale, were there other women studying set design? Uh, no. And in fact, I was the first woman to graduate Yale in set design. Women were actively discouraged from, from being set designers at the time and, and were steered into lighting and costume design. Costumes especially. There's Lot plenty of, of women costume designers. Yep. It's, you know, that's okay. Yeah, women do clothes. Women do clothes. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, how did this happen to you? You mean that I, I survived? <laughs> <laughs> survived living How did bodies you want it? Way. Why did you want it? Um, I, I, well, one of the reasons is I can't stand dealing with actors' figure problems, <laughs> at, you know, and talking about socks and shoes. I just find the trivia of the costume designer just not particularly engaging. And I very much liked always dealing with a big picture. Mm -hmm. And especially designing musicals, uh, the... the the imagery of a musical very much sets the tone and informs how the piece is done. It has an enormous impact on the show. I'm, I'm less interested in doing straight plays because it just doesn't, in the end, have, have that much of an impact in, in what the show is going to be like and how it's perceived. But for musical, it really, it's the, it's, it really motors the show. In fact, in many ways, if you look back over the decades, it's the set design that has changed more than anything else in the theater, right? The demands, the technical expertise. I mean, there's some fabulous set designers now. This oh, is yeah. really, this is really the art form in many ways. It has, and and I think audiences are much more accepting of risks and abstractions. Um, they're much less literal minded. Yeah, and you don't do literalism. I don't do that. <laughs> Bless no. you. Bless you for that. Yes. Yeah, there, there's an increased uh, tolerance even among producers to take risks because they understand the audience is really eager to see something innovative. And of course, what we're competing with visually in, in film is so uh, uh, difficult to, to overcome that they're willing to, for us to sort of just take exactly. a shot. I was going to ask you that because I was thinking that the pressure from movies and also the pressure to compete with rock concerts, mm -hmm. that in fact there might be even too much pressure on, on the spectacle aspect, which I think is what we saw maybe in the 80s from the, the British so-called mega musicals, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when the content was almost degraded in favor of the spectacle. This doesn't happen in your shows. But never. Never, <laughs> never. <laughs> never. Uh, but, but is there pressure to make things fly more and chandeliers fall down? And you know, it, I think every show is different. And what you tend to succumb to, frankly, is the strength of the material, which is, uh, I tend to uh, approach a show, and if I, I see the material is weak, I feel I have to compensate for it by making it more exciting visually, which is probably a, um, a temptation I should try to avoid. But um, some, and some materials, uh, you really don't need to, to layer a lot of visual excitement on it in order to make it work. I can think of a lot of shows I think work primarily because of what is happening visually and without the visual spectacle there's no show. There are quite a few shows running right now on Broadway oh. like that. Oh no. Oh yes. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked. I think we should clear up one thing. If people are getting confused and saying Heidi Attinger, I thought Heidi Landisman won those awards. Now you did a very bold thing after your divorce and changed mm -hmm. your name. Um, how, back to your maiden name. Yes. You were married to Rocco Landisman, who, of mm -hmm. course, is the, the head of the third largest real producer and o owner of real estate in the, on Broadway. And, and so all of your awards, you had, you had actually established your career 
mm -hmm. uh, as Heidi Landesman. Right. And how did you decide to go back to your other name? That's really scary in a way. You have to be cross-referenced now. I know it's confusing, but you know, hard on libraries. Well, it's difficult, but the, you know, the theater business is so tiny. I mean, that's about 200 people, really, <laughs> and everybody knows each other. And and I figured everyone would figure out pretty quickly. Um, I just thought it was sort of silly to go through the rest of my life with my ex-husband's name. I just it just seemed illogical to me, and um, and I had certainly started out. Uh, it, well, although I did get married pretty soon after school using my maiden name, and I just felt more comfortable, and, and I didn't want to have to explain all the time who I was. That was, yeah. that was one of the problems. I'm not his sister. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So, um, and, and it's, I think everyone's pretty much figured it out by now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I read once, and you said, besides, there's only one. How many Heidi's are there in the business? In fact, Wendy Wasserstein named Heidi Chronicles after you. Is this true? Yeah. yeah. Now, you met, you met both Rocco and Wendy at Yale. At Yale, yes. And besides the title of her play, is there more about her Pulitzer Prize winning play that's based on your life? No. Okay. No. I right. think she just liked the name. Okay, I'll yeah. drop that. And people are constantly calling me Wendy, and I think they're calling her Heidi, too, from oh. some day. Everyone gets it mixed up. <laughs> you have a sister, Heidi. But I that's a, it. Yes, yes, I, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you were working before, during your marriage, mm -hmm. you were also a co-producer often. Are mm -hmm. you still producing shows? I am. And, in fact, the, the uh, Little Princess project I'm talking about now, I'm working on now, is is one that I've developed and I'm producing with a number of the other producers. Well, you want to talk a little bit about this? You have two yeah, projects sure. coming up. Yes, okay. I do. Uh, uh, Little Princess is based on the on the Frances Burnett novel mm -hmm. and really came about because a group of Australian producers came to me and said, would you put together a family show? Because they'd had such success in Australia with various family projects I'd worked on and I have become I think kind of the family gal somehow. Do you do you feel do you feel a little typecast in that? A, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. The I kind mean, of girly thing happened. Yeah, yeah. And kind of the kid friendly thing. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. I, I I have a great desire really to do King Lear, but no one's going to ask me to do it. Put a little Beckett in there now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it so doesn't. You know, go that ahead. does anyway. happen anyway. Um, so I uh, went to Susan Shulman, who I've worked with before, director, and. Um, and we came up with this idea of doing Little Princess, and we've gone through a series of workshops and readings, and uh, we now have American co-producers. Uh, so I'm designing it now, and we'll bring it in next season. Who's doing the music? It's Andrew Lippa. Oh. Who did the... Who did Wild Party. Yes. One of the Wild Parties. Yes. The, the, I would call it the good Wild Party, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, he did. And you're also doing, um, doing the sets for Wendy Wasserstein's musical... American, American in Paris. Paris. Yeah. And those yes. are both going to be in the season of 90, 80, oh dear. Um, the of, next of one. Oh, oh, 0304? Yes. Oh, 0304. Oh, 304. Okay. Yes. Yes. Basically, although there's great variety in your work, you tend to create enchanted worlds, which may be why you're typecast, but in mm -hmm. that's, the bad thing is that it typecasts, the good thing is that you make enchanted worlds and each one is different. I hope so. Um, <laughs> We have here Tom Sawyer, mm -hmm. which opened and closed and was a heartbreak because I thought it was really going to be the, the show that every pubescent girl was dragging her mother to go see. It was really a lovely show. And, uh, and this must be very hard on you when you put that much love into a show and see them come and go like that. It's very tough. Yeah. Very tough. Um, I'm sure you've talked to a number of theater people about <laughs> failures because they're so common and, and unavoidable and um, and especially when you see that that you like your work and you have no control over what el what happens to the show it's a, it's a very frustrating experience because yours is just one element right right which is actually one of the reasons that I went back into producing because as a producer I have a little bit more control over ultimately what happens with the show mm -hmm. so I don't have to really just sit back and watch the whole thing fall apart to that degree. So That same season that Tom Sawyer, there were, you had two exquisite sets, really. Uh, there was Tom Sawyer, Sawyer and there was also the musical Triumph of Love that right. were both, both magical worlds, um, right. both musicals that I thought deserved to exist. And I found it really, for me, disenchanting that musicals that were gentle seemed to me 
not to have a life right now. That unless, unless they're hitting you over the head with the musical comedy, unless someone's coming up to you and make, trying to make you smile and laugh, mm -hmm. um, that, that there seems to be right now not an appetite for it. Are you finding that? I am finding that, and I'm hearing from producers particularly, oh, it's a charming show, but it's not exciting enough. And you think, well, do you have to be exciting all the time? <laughs> you know, is that, is that what we're all aiming for? Um, I think that's very true. I, and, and I certainly think some of the, the more successful shows right now are, are really in your face yeah, totally in, 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 a, in a, I think, very off-putting way. But clearly there's an audience for that. Although I don't believe there's really not an audience for a show that is not completely aggressive all the time. I think that audience is there. They just haven't found that the, the show that works for them hasn't really turned up yet, but it will. Or it hasn't been marketed to them. They don't give That's it a chance. It's not given it a, a chance to, to breathe. I know a lot of people who had tickets for Tom Sawyer and mm -hmm. the show was closed before they could even get there. Yeah, so yeah. It wasn't that does happen. It's heartbreaking. It really is. But, you know, these shows are so expensive to run. I think producers watch the, the hemorrhage start, yeah. and, um, and they very few of them, I think, have the ability or, or desire to overcome. Uh, in, in Tom Sawyer's case, mixed reviews mm -hmm. and, and find the audience. It's a lot of reason, though, that they're so expensive is because, because so much goes into the spectacle now. Are you the devil? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, not really. Yeah. If you look at the numbers, um, the reality is that the, the, the things that eat most of the budget, certainly the physical production is, is a big chunk, but the advertising budget is enormous. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the theater rents are enormous, and the stage hands, the cost of the load in is enormous, so it all tends to add up. But the, I, I don't think the, certainly the cost of physical production have risen hugely I, when we first did Big River 18 years ago, uh, I think this cost maybe four times as much, <laughs> ultimately. That's how much it's escalated. But when you look at the overall economic picture, I don't think it's the spectacle that's, that's making it so difficult for the shows to run. Could you talk to me a little bit about process? That how much, okay, you meet with a director. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it when you're not a producer. Okay. Okay. Uh, when you're a freelance set design. Mm -hmm. And the director calls you and says, I want to do, which is one that you've done, Sound of Music. Mm -hmm. You were not a, you were not a, pr a mm -hmm. producer of that. Mm -hmm. And then the director talks to you about, in this case, her, thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. concept of the show. How much input then do you have on what you think it should look like? Well, every director is very different in terms of how much information they really give you up yeah. front. Some directors just give you some fuzzy adjectives to run with, and some directors will come in with, say, images of paintings or style. Who did um, that? I'm trying to remember. Actually, I think Jim Lapine did because he's a very because he, he is actually visual and comes from that yeah. kind of. Background. And you direct a lot of plays for him, mm -hmm. Twelve Dreams, mm -hmm. and, and also yes. this Hunchback that we did in in Berlin. In Berlin, in Berlin. A Hunchback in Notre Dame in yes. Berlin. Is yeah. that ever coming in? I okay. don't know. That's <laughs> Disney. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So <laughs> other directors would be give you some sort of some vague of them idea. are more yes, and, and, but uh, but some of them really um, are are reactive in nature. Not Susan. She's very proactive. Uh -huh. Some are Susan reactive. Susan Shulman, right? Yeah. And some really want to hear what your response is to the, to the material before starting to generate a specific style or direction to go in. I had the feeling that S Secret Garden specifically was extremely collaborative. It you know, was. That really was. seemed to work. Uh, you, know, was, you did this big Victorian Valentine set, really. Mm -hmm. And it just had the, the, the feeling that all of the elements really were working together for one vision. Was, am I putting words in your mouth? No, I think that's true. Although it was a situation in which, in the course of doing research, and I always do a great deal of research, I came across a set of images, which were these Victorian scrapbook images, which I found so bizarre and sort of surrealistic that I, I took them to Susan and said, I think there's something quite interesting here, and this may be a direction to go in. And she got very excited. So we were able to then run with that that sort of concept. And, and sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the the director will be the one who brings you that initial image, and then you, you respond to it. So it's different. If I said the skin of your teeth, what do you think of? Boy, if, that's a... <laughs> if, I say Miss, if I say Miss Porter's boarding school for girls. Uh, yes. Your first set design, 
I feel like um, I'm doing this is your you life. Live? Where are you? This How, is you your think, life. Where did you get that okay. information from? Okay, here's That's this little girl who's ago. raised in the Bay Area and mm -hmm. gets sent off to boarding school in the mm -hmm. East and directed your first play and also did the set design I did. for the skin, the, skin, the skin of our teeth, the skin of your teeth. Your teeth. Your teeth, the skin of your teeth. Yeah. And do you have any recollection of what that looked like? God, I remember, uh, I remember the opening, uh, the opening line, six o'clock and the master not home yet. I remember that very <laughs> clearly. Um, I don't remember much about it, except I just, uh, uh, the, the wonderful thing about Miss Porter School is that they let me do whatever I wanted to do. Ultimately, once I said, well, this, I love this world, they said, oh, do whatever you want, direct, write, act, you know, have a good time. And that was, that was a very nice place to be able to be And for did, those reasons. Did you actually, like, take out a hammer and bid, build sets? Oh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, oh, this yeah. whole idea when people think about set designers, it's the concept of how abstract is it? Do you sit and draw it and, and do your, your beautiful models, or how much of it is really hands-on? Well, what do the unions let you do? The, <laughs> you know, the unions, I probably shouldn't say that, have always been very sweet to me. And, and they, in fact, even though I'm not supposed to, you know, pick up a paintbrush ever, if I do do it, everyone's, everyone, they rather like it because it means that I'm involved and I'm committed and I'm willing to sort of get my hands dirty. Um, uh, but the, the things that I'm allowed to do on a Broadway stage are, are practically non-existent. Uh, and in the studio, it really acts like it's like a, an architectural firm. Really, I take uh, we do the scale models and the scale images, and then they get then translated in a shop and painted by wonderful scenic artists. So it's um, certainly in the beginning when you do off Broadway, you do have to do it yourself. You're up there doing all night paint calls and coming home covered with paint and drenched. Do you miss that at all? No, okay. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. Okay. And in fact, sometimes when these these job opportunities come up and they're friends and they're doing it off Broadway. I just say, you know, I'm too old for that. I wish I could, but I just can't. There was a time when that. you said that well, you came out of the nonprofits. You did yes. a lot of work in the nonprofits, yes. and then there was a time when you you said that you thought there was a lot of that there was just a disturbing amount of paternalism going on in the nonprofits. Do you remember could saying I say that? that? I could have said that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I could have said that. Do you still think yeah. that that in some ways it it can be destructive? It can be. It can be. Um, I, also, the the other problem with the nonprofits is that y you the the projects tend to not have a life after you do them, mm -hmm. that they fit into a slot in a season, and then generally that's the end of it. And whereas in a commercial situation, you always have this possibility, this exciting possibility that the show will go on and it'll en enter the culture and it'll be taught in schools. So your work has a has a much more satisfying potential end result than in a regional theater. When it does, I, uh, intellectual property rights make my head hurt. I can never mm -hmm. understand if someone in at the Drury Lane Theater in suburban Chicago does Big River and they see in the script a little drawing of what yours look like and they put it on like that. Do you get money? <laughs> well, no. It, it's a it's a very dicey area and continues to be dicey. Yeah. I mean, I've heard stories of you know productions in Austria that have taken my work and mm -hmm. and replicated. Theoretically, they're not allowed to do that, but um, my union really has very little jurisdiction, and and it's it's basically out of their control. So in theory, it should be. I should be paid for that, but it unfortunately happens all the time yeah. that it just gets. Or at the very least, get credit somewhere. Yes, yes, you would think. Based on the original Broadway production by. That would be nice, mm -hmm. but I think the reality by is. By Heidi, that, what's her name? Yeah, what, whichever one that was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, going back to to, uh, to to little Heidi back in. Uh, how, how did you know that this theater thing was for you? You didn't really go to Othello when you were eight years old. Did I you? really did. That's the truth. <laughs> I was <laughs> the first play I saw was Othello, and I remember it very clearly because I kept saying to my parents, "What's a whore? What does whore mean?" And nobody would tell me. My older siblings would giggle in the corner as I kept trying to figure out what was going on in this play. Um, but yes, I remember it very clearly, and uh, and I guess I just became stage struck the way most people who make their living in the theater do. And then your your major in Los Angeles was art 
and theater. Yes. Which is what let what so you could do both. I could but, do both. But you wanted to act for a while, right? I did. I did. You know, again, everybody starts out wanting to be an actress. Um, <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> very good choice. <laughs> very good choice. Um, and, and so I always did a bit of everything, yeah. um, which I think is very important for people working in the theater to do. I think they need to be exposed to all different um, uh, parts of the process. So I did do that for a while. And then I think I realized that I just can't survive being rejected all the time <laughs> the way actresses are. And that it seems to me a very hard life, very hard, and not one that I was psychologically up to. And I don't think I was that good anyway, in reality. And yet it wasn't that hard for you to be accepted as a set designer? I mean, it's a pretty burly world you're in, isn't it? Well, you know, I don't think so. Uh, that, that's, that's the impression, but I've always found that all of the, the backstage crew and the stagehands and the shops are delighted to have a woman in their presence. And um, I bring them cookies, and they show me pictures of their children, and... Um, and they're very happy to have me there, and I have very good relationships with most of the, most of the theaters and the crews, and um, and they enjoy it and I enjoy it. So I think that's not really the case. And uh, you have no idea why there aren't more of you coming up. As time goes on, I I originally had a theory that um, it, it, it's similar to the reasons that there's so few women architects. And they're becoming, they're more, but it's certainly a male-dominated profession. And I think there's a perception that women in theater are comfortable with clothes and costumes, and they're comfortable with light, but they're not comfortable with hard materials, you know, with steel and wood and, and mechanics, and that that is not really the purview of women's. And, and I, I think the other reason is that um, it just economically, uh, the the biggest chunk of the budget of any show goes to the set, physical production. And I think there's a certain reluctance on the part of, of producers, both male and female, I might say, to, in, 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 to entrust those monies to a woman. This is, it this seems is, to be the case. This is my deep background theory about why there aren't more women Broadway critics, is that off-Broadway is and ballet is their arts. Yeah. That's okay. That's yeah. the arts. But Broadway's about money. It is. And it is. somewhere deep inside the people who make these decisions, that's where you want to have the men. Yeah. And I, I hate to say that, you know, and I've been very fortunate. I've been doing mm -hmm. this for years. Mm -hmm. But where are the other ones? Exactly. Yeah. Where yeah. are the other ones? It, and it's very strange. And there certainly should be more out yeah. there. It's very peculiar. And... Um, and I quite honestly did keep expecting that by this time, since I've been doing this, I think, forever, there would be a whole, a whole legion of women. But they're all doing ballet off-Broadway. A lot of them are doing TV and film. Mm. But very few of them are doing commercial theater. I mean, actually, none that are Americans. That's the reality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only other Tony winner female is uh, Maria Bjornsson, right. who won for uh, Phantom of the Opera. Right. Which was spectacular. Right. So. Yes, and I suspect there will be another one this season for La Boheme, but she is Australian. Uh -huh. But it's not going to be a, an American, no. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. bizarre. And at home there are three boys? Yes, <laughs> yes. They, do they want to be in the biz? I think my little one does. Yes. I think the youngest one, who's 12, who spent, I think, saw Tom Sawyer about 18 times, hung out backstage, He's seen the producers uh, now literally 20 times. Oh, that's bad for his brain. That's bad. <laughs> that's bad. He can sing the scores mm -hmm. to everything. I think that he's going to be the showbiz kid. Uh -huh. I think the other two prob I look at this world and think, who, who needs this? This is, this is too erratic in existence. And you, back to the process, because I'm fascinated with this. How much research do you do? Do you do... Um, a lot of background. I read somewhere that you went to Salzburg, Salzburg to 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 look at the Alps for for inspiration <laughs> for Sound of Music. I mean, that good was a trip, great trip, good trip. But <laughs> did you need to do that? Well, actually, it was it was enormously helpful, yeah. uh, and it wasn't so much looking at the scenery, yeah. but at the Abbey and the, yeah. the way the nuns actually lived and some of those villas. You know, we have these images in our head, especially shows that are based on very well-known films that are very cliche-ridden. We, we went to Hannibal, Missouri for Tom Sawyer. 
which was really helpful because um, we sort of understood how not to do the show. That, but that's useful information, that, that there's a whole uh, image, set of images that are cliches that are buried in our collective unconscious, and that's the way you don't want to present the material because you can't be fresh and you can't bring a new perspective to it. How did you come up with the idea of the, the, um, the tunnels? Oh, and that, that landscape. Yeah, yeah, they had to go, they had to get lost in all the tunnels under, mm -hmm. underground. Mm -hmm. And it was so imaginative. Um, did that take you a long time? Do you get these ideas in the middle of the night? What happens? What <laughs> the, this, the idea for this actually came from a, um, there was an installation at PS1 in, um, in Long Island City that was a, a wooden installation, and I think it was for... Uh, sort of a playground beach thing, and I found it so interesting and so playful, and um, and the fact that there there were pictures of kids running around and hiding in it, and I and I very much wanted the environment to be one in which the children could have a really good time. That would be an active rather than passive environment for them to to be in, and. Um, but that was abstract at the same time and, and took us away from all of those cliches. Yeah, it didn't look like any place I'd ever been, and yet I wanted to stay there. That, yeah. Well, and it also came, um, uh, it was partly that, and then I did a lot of research into American folk art. And there's something about the naivete of that, and at the same time, the really wonderful, clean graphic quality of it that, that got me very excited. So it, it's... I tend to do research until my eye stops and, and I go, that's yeah. the way to do it. I have one last question, okay. which is, I think we've answered it in some ways, but it, as a woman, if there's one thing right now that you could change in the theater, if you could just snap your fingers and change it, what would it be? Woo. Uh, <laughs> I, I changed the economic structure because the economic structure is now such that it's 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 a very tough arena to enter. Right. And it, thank that's you. It? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, <laughs> Heidi Ettinger. Thanks so much. Okay. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.